In recent NFL history, no other class receives the same negative spotlight like the 2013 NFL Draft. 2013 is considered to have possibly the worst class of all time. And looking specifically at the top 10, the lack of skill position talent, combined with the large number of disappointing busts, just goes to show how much these individual classes can vary. Today, we will look briefly at each of the top 10 picks, see how their careers turned out, and compare these guys historically to other classes to see where 2013 stacks up. With the first pick in the 2013 NFL Draft, the Kansas City Chiefs select Eric Fisher, tackle, Central Michigan. As perhaps the most forgotten about number one pick in recent memory, Eric Fisher sort of disappeared from the spotlight naturally, and this was mostly because he played offensive line. Usually, first overall selections receive so much hype that they get constantly discussed and debated about on sports shows, but that just didn't happen with this guy. After the draft, his only real moment in the spotlight throughout his first five seasons was his infamous hold on a two-point conversion versus the Steelers in the 2017 playoffs. To a national audience, this was a sort of Oh yeah, that guy went number one overall and I totally forgot about that. But in reality, despite things starting out quiet, he eventually proved himself worth a $48 million extension in 2016. By 2018, Fisher was a cornerstone left tackle for Kansas City, making his first of two Pro Bowls, and he played a big role in the Chiefs' run to their 2019 Super Bowl victory. Ultimately, Eric Fisher played nine years in the NFL and he became very reliable considering he hardly missed any games over his career. Fisher can be described as a guy who was good, but a sort of underwhelming number one pick, probably more to do with the position he played than anything. In any other draft, he's probably a mid first round selection, but as we go through the rest of this top 10, you'll understand more why he went number one. But before we see just how bad this class was, this video is sponsored by the number one rated ticketing app, SeatGeek. With over 28 million downloads, SeatGeek has more than 70,000 events available every single day, including concerts, festivals, and sports. Over here in Sacramento, we are currently witnessing history as the Kings are on the verge of their first playoff appearance since 2006. And I plan on going to see them play at least one more time this season. SeatGeek always wants to make sure that you're getting a good deal. So when you're on the app, look for the green dots. Green means good and red means bad. Every ticket is backed by their buyer guarantee, and SeatGeek is the only site that lets you return your tickets ahead of the event with swaps. And you know I came through for you guys. Use my code KTO for $20 off tickets at SeatGeek. That's $20 off your first purchase with promo code KTO. Make sure you click the link in the description to download the app. With the second pick in 2013, the Jacksonville Jaguars also selected an offensive tackle, Texas A&M's Luke Jokel. Coming off a season where he was awarded the Outland Trophy, given to the nation's top interior lineman, Jokel received heavy praise among scouting circles. One NFL general manager said, quote, I think he's better than Joe Thomas and Matt Khalil. Jokel was considered the most polished tackle prospect, and the Jags were hoping that they found a solid pass protector to help develop their young quarterback, Blaine Gabbert. But Jokel struggled mightily. Through two seasons, Pro Football Focus ranked him as one of the worst offensive tackles in the NFL. By the end of his rookie contract, he had been a below average pass blocker, considering he gave up a high number of sacks as a starter. In 2016, after suffering an injury, Jokel lost the starting job, and he never returned to the starting lineup. From a mix of underwhelming performance and injuries, Jacksonville decided to not pick up Jokel's fifth year option. And he only played one year in Seattle before not signing with another team following 2017. With the third pick in the 2013 NFL Draft, the Miami Dolphins select Deion Jordan, defensive end, Oregon. As a player known for his raw athleticism, speed, and versatility, Deion Jordan was a boom or bust type of prospect, considering he was more raw than most early first rounders. But rather quickly, things fell apart. Prior to the 2013 draft, Jordan had surgery for a torn labrum, which he would re-aggravate during the preseason. And this affected him throughout 2013. He never did enough to start as a rookie or play more than 30 snaps a game. Then the following year, 
Jordan was suspended for four games due to violating the substance abuse policy, and once he returned, he barely played. In what felt like a make or break year entering season number three, Jordan would be suspended the entire season after a diluted sample was found, which meant that he had violated the substance abuse policy for the second straight year. After not playing football for over a year and a half, Jordan returned to the team and didn't play a single down in year four. He was released from the team in 2017 following a failed physical. After leaving Miami, Deion Jordan did play more, but not much on his legacy had changed. Amongst Miami fans, he's considered a bust, and in 2019, he was suspended one more time for Adderall use. And overall, Jordan lasted six seasons, only starting in five total games. With the fourth pick in 2013, the Eagles took quarterback Lane Johnson. Wait, quarterback? Yep, that's right. Lane Johnson played quarterback in college. Well, at least briefly. It's actually an absurd story. When Johnson began his college career, he was a JUCO quarterback for one season before he transferred to Oklahoma. In 2009, he was the scout team quarterback before moving to tight end in 2010, then switched again to defensive end in 2011. But shortly after that college season began, two Oklahoma starting offensive linemen went down with injuries. And the O-line coach, Bruce Kittle, asked a few players, including Johnson, to try out as a backup to fill those missing roster spots. To the absolute shock of Coach Kittle, Lane Johnson demonstrated excellent footwork and a natural gift for blocking. Literally two weeks later, Johnson became the team's starting right tackle and he played the rest of the season there. The following year, Johnson switched to left tackle and dominated, becoming a third team All-American and he impressed scouts enough at the Senior Bowl to be drafted fourth overall in 2013. And just to add to this already epic story, Lane Johnson became one of, if not the best right tackle in the game by 2017. He earned first team all pro that year and he played a major role in the Eagles run to their Super Bowl win. Johnson is truly a Goliath of a man, coming in at 6'6", 325. He's a brick wall that even the best edge rushers in the game can't get past. In 2022, he set an NFL record for not allowing a sack in 26 straight games. As a four-time Pro Bowler, two-time First Team All-Pro, and Super Bowl champion, Lane Johnson is one of the very few gems of this entire 2013 first round. With the fifth pick in 2013, the Lions took the second defensive end off the board, Ezekiel Ziggy Ansah. With back-to-back -back picks, we have back-to-back -back epic journeys to the NFL. Ansa grew up in Ghana, and after being baptized by a couple Mormon missionaries, he moved from Ghana to America and pursued a college basketball career at BYU. Long story short, Ziggy Ansa didn't make the team, but after running track for BYU, he was spotted by the football coaches and they recruited him to come try out. Within three years, Ansa went from not knowing anything about American football to becoming one of the most dominant defensive ends in the nation. At 6 foot 5 and 275 pounds, he was called the sleeper of the NFL draft. And right away, he began to make an impact for the Lions, leading all rookies in sacks. By 2015, he made a Pro Bowl and second team All Pro with 14 and a half sacks. It seemed like Detroit had found their guy to build around on defense. Only, that didn't happen. 2015 was the peak of Ansah's pro career. His play became at best inconsistent, where he would have a big production year like 2015, then have a huge drop off in 2016, bounce back in 2017, then struggle mightily in 2018 with injuries and inconsistent play. He moved on from Detroit and played two more seasons elsewhere as a backup, and injuries seemed to be the major cause to his exit from the league in 2020. Overall, Ansa wasn't a bust. He started for five years in Detroit with one great season, but inconsistencies and injuries defined most of his career. With the sixth pick in 2013, the Browns took the first linebacker off the board, Barkevius Mingo. He was a springy and explosive 3-4 edge rusher who was described as having one of the best spin moves of the class. This felt like destiny because the name Barkevius was truly unique and it was a perfect match for the dog pound, or at least it seemed. 
Within two years, it was clear that Mingo was struggling to adjust to the pro game. For playing a position that should be productive, he just wasn't. His speed didn't pop like it did in college. And because he was undersized, Mingo struggled to get off blocks. By year three, the Browns were ready to move on and traded him to New England for a fifth round pick. Ultimately, Mingo played for six teams in six years, with only one year as a starter. And in 2021, his football career ended after Mingo was arrested on a second degree felony charge of indecency and sexual contact with a minor. Those charges were later dismissed. With the seventh pick in 2013, the Cardinals selected the first guard off the board, Jonathan Cooper. Even at his monstrous size, Cooper moved surprisingly well. He was regarded as one of the smoothest athletes one scout had ever seen for a guard. But unfortunately, this guy had some of the worst injury luck I've ever seen. His career began with a broken leg, and from then on, he was never the same athlete. Year in and year out, Jonathan Cooper battled through brutal injuries. He only lasted two years in Arizona because of it, and from there, he was on a new team every year, with almost every season ending because of injury. After suffering a torn bicep in 2018, his pro career was over. With the eighth pick in 2013, the first skill position player finally came off the board, with the Rams taking the flashy Tavon Austin. I recently made a video going over Austin's pro career, but I'll cover it here once again. Austin was only 5'8", 175 pounds, but he seemed to justify a top 10 pick at the time because in college, this dude was so much better than everybody. His speed and elusiveness were unrivaled. What Tyreek Hill became in the NFL is what people envisioned for Tavon Austin, but that ultimately didn't happen. In short, he flashed his skills in the return and receiving game right off the bat, and he was the Rams' utility knife for his first four seasons, although he didn't play as big of a role as the team had hoped. Still, they felt that he was valuable enough to pick up his fifth-year option, and they gave Austin a $42 million extension. But with a regime change, Tavon's role became diminished, and they traded him after that, and he would go on to play the rest of his career as a backup receiver. At his peak, Austin was the Rams' most targeted receiver, but he never amassed more than 1,000 receiving and rushing yards in the same season. With the ninth pick in 2013, the Jets took the first corner off the board, Alabama's D. Milliner. Milliner locked down everybody in college. His ideal size, instincts, speed, and strength projected him as a future number one corner in the NFL. He appeared to have no limitations schematically. But as a rookie, Milner had a hard time making the adjustment to the pros, as he was benched on three separate occasions for poor performance. He did manage to finish off his rookie campaign on a high note, with three interceptions in the final two games. But a couple injuries, including a torn Achilles in 2014, devastated Milner's career. A torn Achilles is one of the worst possible injuries one can get. It has a 6-12 to 12 month recovery time span, and even then, you're not the same athlete when you get back. Milner, when he came back, was a step slower. And to make matters worse, a wrist injury that he sustained in training camp required surgery that put him out till mid-season. Milner only ended up playing in two games that year before being released and receiving no interest from other NFL teams. Milner only lasted three total seasons and played in 21 career games. With the 10th pick in 2013, the Titans took the second guard off the board, and the guy who Mike Mayock felt was the best prospect overall, Chance Warmack. Entering the NFL at a monstrous 317 pounds, Warmack was considered arguably the best guard prospect since seven-time Pro Bowler Steve Hutchinson. Early on, Warmack was a consistent starter for three years. However, his level of play had only been average at best, he had not developed into the dominant level player the Titans had hoped, and after an injury in year four, Warmack was demoted to the bench once he returned to the lineup, and the team chose to not re-sign him following the season. Bo Wolf, a writer for The Athletic, wrote a piece on the Eagles roster back in 2018 after Warmack signed with them, and he called him a quote, replacement level guard who offers less positional versatility than you might like in a backup offensive lineman. 
Overall, Warmack did become a Super Bowl champion as a backup, but his final season was in 2018, and he was only a majority starter in three of his six NFL seasons. So, in wrapping up this video, let's compare the top 10 picks from 2013 to every other class from 2000 to 2016. I decided to rank them on the amount of 4 plus year starters that the top 10 produced, and 2013 comes out dead last by this metric. The average class during this time has 5.4 pro bowlers in the top 10, and 2013 only produced 3. Tack on the fact that the best two players from the 2013 top 10 are offensive linemen, and it makes sense why 2013 is such a forgettable year. Now, it's kind of weird how things work sometimes. Most of these players mentioned in this video, despite being selected so high in the draft, made very little impact in their NFL careers, and all but two are out of the league. But also from that same year, the guy who ended up setting the NFL record for most consecutive 100-yard games made more Pro Bowls than 8 of the top 10 picks, and just signed a $25 million contract 10 years into his pro career, wasn't selected back in 2013. In fact, the two-time Pro Bowler, Adam Thielen, went undrafted. And the Vikings are the beneficiaries. Cousins, looking, Jefferson was covered. Other side! 